And he joins us right now to talk about his new line of masks from Boomer Naturals. You can get him right now on boomernaturals.com. He is the incomparable. You might know him as the soup Nazi, but we call him Larry Thomas. Larry, how are you doing today? I'm good, man. Thanks. You doing good? Yeah, you know what? We can't complain down here in, in, in good old Houston, Texas. But let's talk about it, man. Let's get right into it. The mask. You were holding it up right before we went uh, live. No mask, no soup. Look at it. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful piece <laughs> of material there. You see it? There it is. Um, how, did, how did this come about with you and Boomer Naturals? And, and where did the idea come from to do uh, a, a signature line of face covers? Well, you know, I do a lot of cameos. And somewhere that, you know, the, it's, it's interesting because it became a pandemic proof job. In fact, it uh, became bigger because of the pandemic. You know, buying a cameo for somebody is like, you know, easier than going shopping or whatever. But I, after a while, you know, I started noticing that a lot of people are walking around my neighborhood without masks on. And it's kind of bugging me because here in California, um, it's getting worse. You know, it's not getting better. And so um, at one point, I started to say in some of my cameos, you know, um, the ordering procedure, uh, step six feet to the left, wearing your mask, no mask, no soup. <laughs> and um, I have a friend that's a trademark attorney. And we were talking a couple of years ago about a guy that trademarked No Soup For You because it had never been trademarked, but he didn't really have a right to trademark it. He kind of was working with a soup company um, that were attempting to package the soups of Al Yegane, the guy that um, I sort of portrayed more or less. But, uh, you know, Warner Brothers owns Castle Rock and Castle Rock owned the script and the script was copyrighted and so it was kind of a weird little slippery thing this guy did and um so i called my friend and i said you know i better i just came up with a phrase and i better trademark it before some complete stranger decides to trademark it and, and you know leave me out of it so we trademarked no mask no soup and uh i did a little psa um for myself and put it on my facebook page and uh one of them uh, execs from uh, Boomer Naturals, I had met her before and she just saw it. She messaged me and she said, how would you like to put that into practice? And, you know, we make masks. And I said, I would love it. So they kicked around a few designs. I gave them, you know, license and permission to use my, uh, my photo that I own which was another idea of Castle Rock. They way, way, way back when their legal department said, go out, suit up as the soup Nazi, take your own photograph, copyright it and own it. And then you can't bother us. We can't bother you. And really nice of them to suggest that to me. And um, so, you know, I gave Boomer the licensing rights to use the phrase in my face and they came up with this mask and I love it. I mean, I, I love their design. And uh, it's just a lot of fun. You know, I know it's not a product, uh, hopefully not a product that's going to be around for a long time. Uh, but just for the short time that it might be around, um, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> I like it. No, and they look great. And, I, you know, I was talking to Suzanne over there at Boomer Naturals, and she said that as soon as they launched, through the roof with sales. I mean, they were selling them like crazy over there. So I know – it's a it's a good product that a lot of people are gravitating toward right now. And then you then you got to to uh, become the soup Nazi again on camera, working with a uh, a Donald Trump impersonator who uh, the Trump refuses to wear the the mask, and and you kick him out of the soup stand. How how much fun was that? That was a ball. I mean, first of all, you know my feelings about Trump <laughs> are pretty strong, and um. Uh, so the fact that I would get to kick him out, you know, as soon as she told me that that was the idea they were working on, I said, I'm in. And then, um, it was so much fun to shoot because John, uh, Domenico, the, the Trump impersonator is just, he's great. I mean, he has him down. Yeah. And, uh, 
Michaela Gordon, who played Melania, she was she was great. I mean, so it was just a a lot of fun working with you know really talented people and um, getting to kind of recreate uh, the character is always fun. You know, um, the, you know people don't realize this, but what I really got to do in 1995 was six minutes and then about a half a minute to a minute in the finale. So there's really only about seven minutes of the, of the soup Nazi. And uh, so every time I get to play it again, it's sort of like, you know, uh, fleshing out a character you, you, you would like to play more of as an actor. Like I would have loved to do a, you know, him to be a series character. And um, so I always have fun playing him again. And so it was fun doing it. And, uh, you know, the commercial has two endings. Right. Uh, in one, Trump gets his soup and in one he doesn't. So, so if you go to their website, you get to watch both commercials and then you get to vote. And the last time I was there, it was about 68 to 70% uh, voted that he doesn't get his soup. So <laughs> if that's, <if> that's <laughs> going to tell us what... If that's going to tell us what's going to happen in the election, you know. <laughs> we'll see. You know, it's funny, though, that, that you bring up you only had that limited time uh, on screen to play the soup Nazi, but, but you know, connected with so many people. And, and, you, and you've, you know, been the soup Nazi then ever since. My co-host right here, uh, Mr. Cedric Duplichain, was actually in the episode of the soup Nazi as well. He played customer number two. In no, you should have asked him whether he remembered me. <laughs> Wait a minute. I do remember. Of course. You're the guy that said she's in a, he's in a good mood today, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then I, I throw her out, and you're, you did that brilliantly. You got this big smile on your face that just goes like. <laughs> you did that great. Thank I, you. You didn't have a beard, so I didn't recognize right. you at first. I, I, I don't know if you realize this, but. I mean, I've probably been forced to watch the episode a thousand times, you know. Not that I wouldn't watch any episode of Seinfeld over and over again, because I'm a big fan of the show, but my episode is the one I don't really want to see, keep seeing, you know, because all I, all I really notice these days is like, where did all that hair go? You know? <laughs> but, but so I'm really familiar with all the people that were in it. And yes, you were great. I loved what you did. Thank you know, and, and don't you love the fact that that they did something on Seinfeld that they didn't do on most other sitcoms? They would focus the camera on guest actors. Absolutely. Um, if, if their expressions were funny. And because yes. Jerry, I heard a story that that the editor, when they were editing my episode, the editor actually told Jerry, you're kind of violating this, the format for... Uh, sitcom editing you're mm -hmm. supposed to cut away from the guest people immediately back to the series regulars mm -hmm. and jerry said but if their reactions are funny i want to see right. them." i was just telling so, brad exactly the same thing originally uh the scripting called for them to end the scene on my face that was yeah. the change that jerry seinfeld made on the set mm-hmm Yes. You know, and in editing, and he, I'm, I'm sure I could see him now saying, stay on that guy's face. Right. And the editor is probably going like, well, no, I got to cut to, you know, Julia or whatever. And Jerry Price said, no, he's, what he's doing is funny. And you never cut away from funny. And I, I lucked out from that. You did. And um, to me, like the unsung hero truly of that episode was an extra named Marcia who um, got pulled out of the extra pool. She was actually supposed to be in the uh, Monk's Diner scenes. Uh -huh. And uh, they had built the, the soup uh, counter too long for me to step all the way over to the register, deal with the money, step all the way back to where the soup was. And um, they didn't really build it till like, I think the last final day of rehearsal. So there wasn't a lot of, they couldn't have rebuilt it. And so, I don't know if it was Andy Ackerman, the director, or Larry David, or whoever said it, but someone said, um, get someone to work the register who looks like 
you know, they could be working with the soup Nazi, you know, someone who looks Middle Eastern. And they grabbed this girl, she's actually Brazilian, named Marcia, out of the extra pool and put her there. And she was so amazing. I mean, that you know, the timing when she hands George the money and takes the bag away, got the biggest laugh in the episode. And uh, years and years later, in 2012, I'm working with Jerry on this Acura spot, Super Bowl spot. And we had some downtime and he goes, you know, man, there's something I always wanted to ask you. And I said, what? He goes, who was the girl working the cash register? And I went, oh, her name was Marcia. She was uh, from Brazil. I don't know her last name, but she was an extra on your show. And he goes, an extra? Well, wait a minute. She was brilliant. And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, that explains it because I've been racking my brains trying to remember her audition. Cause I remember like everybody's audition. And I said, no, you didn't have, you didn't cast her. You didn't audition her. She just came in and he goes, my God, her timing was amazing. And I said, I'm really jazzed to hear you say that after all these years, because I've always gotten, you know, comments. I'm like, who was she? Who was she? She was great. And unfortunately for her, it kind of hurt her cause they couldn't put her back, you know, as an extra in the diner because she was so yeah. recognizable. Yeah. In fact, a lot of people used to call her, people, when I'd meet people at autograph shows and stuff, they would call her the soup Nazi's wife. <laughs> <laughs> Cedric, I know you had some, some questions for Larry. No, Larry, I have a question. Um, larger than life characters can be both a blessing and a curse. Uh, has this character on Seinfeld been in any way a curse for you in the industry? Um, you know, if it has, I would, I would be the last one to know because, you know, actors are always the last ones to know anything. Nobody tells us anything. You know, there's, I, I always joke with people that for an actor, there's, there's two answers in Hollywood. Yes. Or ignore. Exactly. Um, no is not, it's not one of them. They don't right. tell you no. They don't tell you why. If you right. don't ever hear from them again, it means it wasn't yes. yes. And so I, you know, I probably, first of all, the, the, the blessing part of it was I, I wasn't auditioning for big TV and stuff. I, I mean, I've done about 18 years of beg, borrow and steal theater around LA, but mm. I couldn't really get into that game of getting called in for uh, big TV shows and stuff. And because of Seinfeld, I suddenly, you know, I got a good agent and I started going out on lots of auditions. But, you know, I'll never really know why I didn't get some of them. Um, like, I remember once I auditioned for Cold Case, and the director, who was also an actor, um, he, I, it, you know, it was a dramatic role. And as soon as I walked in the room, he started laughing. So I had a feeling that maybe it screwed me up on that one. And then I did an episode of CSI, but the funny thing was, when I was at the callback, um, the, there was a, a whole group of people and the, I guess one of the producers was sitting next to the director and the director said to me, he goes, um, I was, I was going to be a convenience store owner. And he said, I probably do a Middle Eastern accent. And the, uh, producer elbowed him and he goes, did you look at his resume? And the director said, no, why? And he goes, look at his resume. And he goes, oh, geez, you were the soup Nazi. And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, okay, don't do the Middle Eastern accent. Then do something else. Do Russian. Which, you know, I ended up doing Russian and getting cast. And then getting the oddest direction I've ever had in my life on the set when we went to shoot it, which was instead of using the Russian accent, try to talk as if your parents speak with a Russian accent, but you don't. And it was like, and go, you know. So um, I always, whenever, you know, I, I show that scene to one of my friends, I go, did I do it? You know, and they go, well, yeah, it does sound like, you don't sound quite like you're speaking, you know, with an American accent, but you can't really tell. But um, anyway, so I, I, I never know if I didn't get things because of the soup Nazi or if, you know, just that's what would have been my career anyway. Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure I don't audition well. 
I kind of come up with a very specific idea and I go in there and I do it. And in the case of the soup Nazi, you know, Jerry laughed his head off for six straight scenes. And in fact, I had only read the first three in the first audition. So here I'm reading and I get to scene number four and realize, oh my God, I've never seen this. And you don't really want to go ice cold, but Jerry was laughing so hard, I decided to just continue. So I read the last three scenes, just ice cold off the paper. Right. And then Jerry um, actually said to me, he goes, you know, man, that was really funny, but he goes, uh, I don't understand why he's quite so mean. So he goes, could you do it again? And, and maybe, you know, make him a little nicer at times. And I, I remember trying to do that but it was like six scenes of silence. Nobody, not even him, laughed at anything. Yes. And I, I thought that was gonna screw me out of it, but when they, ca when they cast me and we went to work that day, I went on the set and Jerry just came over and he goes, you know what, man, forget about the direction I gave you, just do what you did when you, when you came in. For some reason, the meaner, the funnier. Mm -hmm. So I, I, think, I think with me, sometimes I make choices that certain directors or producers don't quite get and so I don't get the part but when you get a guy like Jerry who's into whatever he finds funny whether he understands it or not whether it's his, his idea or not I guess I lucked out so right. in short I just don't know if there's any curse part of it but the blessing part of it just goes on and on and on you know I mean I didn't know as, as an actor if I was ever going to like make a living. I was, like I said, the first like 18 years I was working full time and, and doing theater at night. And then even with the Soup Nazi for the next eight years, I still kept my full time job. And then I think it was around 2003, I started to get offered oddball things like autograph shows, um, certain personal appearances for corporations and stuff. And my best friend, who's an actor, just said, you know, Larry, it's time to take a leap of faith and quit your job and see what happens. And so I did. And um, the, the, the space got filled in by all these kind of appearances and stuff. So I ended up doing much more like live stuff than, um, than you know, new roles on TV and stuff, even though I did, you know, I did get to do about, you know, another like 50 TV things and stuff, which was great. And um, funny films like Austin Powers and whatever. Mm. So where I sit right now, I have a 92 year old mother in a board and care and her social security only pays for half of it. And I'm able to pay for the other half. Nice. And pretty much solely through doing cameos and, you know, what I until the pandemic, I used to travel a lot. Like every summer, I would do um, about six or seven uh, minor league baseball games, which were always fun, except for the really scary part of throwing the pitch. <laughs> you don't want to be that guy who ends up on YouTube just throwing it into the stands. <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing about it is the very first time I got asked to do it was for the Cubs, and I wasn't appearing or anything but it's a friend of mine had a skybox there and he talked them into it so i went there and i'd never actually thrown a hardball pitch before so i didn't play baseball you know i always tell the general managers of the minor league teams you know actors are actors because they couldn't play baseball right. and um uh i my friend taught me the form of like how to throw a um an overhand hardball pitch but he, we didn't do the distance. For some strange reason, he didn't think it was important. And I never, I didn't know what the distance was. So when I stood 60 feet away on that mound, it was like vertigo. I mean, it was like, oh my God. <laughs> so I, I just threw it as hard as I could and it went over the catcher's head. And I got booed. You've never right. been booed. <laughs> until you've been booed by Cubs fans. Yeah, They're very good. Out kind of a badge of honor in some ways, right? <laughs> yeah. And then I had to go walk up through the 
uh, the stands to get up to the skybox and then, you know, like, great toss, soup Nazi, learn to pitch, you know, <laughs> only with a Chicago accent, of course. But um, after that, Sony um, did uh, something at the White Sox game and they wanted me to throw a pitch. So this time I made shows working on a low budget film and the producer brought a couple of gloves and a hardball and we just practiced the distance in the parking lot over and over until I could finally just get the ball right to him. It's terrible for him. You could actually look it up. You know, there's pictures on the internet of me throwing that pitch. It's like, it's like this huge overhand snap. And it's, <laughs> I think there was a guy once in Bing Russell's minor league team that pitched something like that. But nobody else pitches like that. But it does get the ball to the plate. Well, that's the and job. That's what you got to accomplish. Yeah. Right? No one will boo you if you get it, even if the, if the catcher has to reach a little bit. As long yeah. as, you know, he can catch it, you know, with the length of his arm, people will applaud you. And uh, that's always the challenge with the minor league teams is like that one moment. And then when that moment's over, it's like, whew, and the rest of the night flies by, you know. But, he, um, but anyway, so, I, you know, this summer I couldn't travel. They canceled baseball and everything. And I was able to keep things supported from cameos. So That's incredible. It's, it's, I mean, it's incredible what, what the, you know, the ability of technology has still afforded us during these times of the pandemic, even getting to talk to each other through Zoom and things of such as that yeah. nature. It's been, it's been pretty incredible. When you talk about the character, you know, Cedric was saying, is it a blessing, is it a curse? The, um, Cedric and I were talking a little bit before you joined us about if you were to walk up to anybody and say, name an episode of Seinfeld, Soup, the Soup Nazi episode is going to be one of the first three ones that they would rattle off. It's one of those most memorable shows. They would say contest, Soup Nazi, and then whatever else, right? Those are going to be – it's one of the most memorable episodes. When, when y'all were both on set – I guess this is a question for both of you. When you were both on set in 95 filming that episode, at the time Seinfeld is the biggest show on television, but did, were you – either one of you aware – of how much this particular episode was going to connect with people? Larry, I'll go to you first. Well, I, I was going to say go to Cedric first. Go to Cedric. I, we'll go to Cedric. I don't, we'll go to Cedric. If, I don't know if he heard what I heard, but I heard some grumbling around the set um, that uh, someone high up there didn't like the script. And he kept saying, I don't think we should do this one, man. I don't think we should do this one. And you know, uh, Andy Ackerman, who was the director, had to kind of explain some of the jokes to him because he didn't think they were funny. Oh. And uh, yeah, and I heard it. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it's really funny because show night I came and I said, so where's my costume? And the, the costume lady said, it's in your trailer. And I went, I have a trailer. And she goes, yeah, it's right behind, you know, soundstage. So I didn't, I spent the whole like week um, just hanging around the set, watching everybody work. It was like, you know, I mean, it was like a great class to wa to watch them rehearse. And I couldn't take my eyes off it. So um, I don't know, Cedric, if you uh, met Tom Barry when when you were working on it. Um, just you know, the director Tom and Jerry Seinfeld. Okay, well, you know, Tom Barry played Elaine's building superintendent that wouldn't let her move the armoire in. Mm. And then later he was one of the you know regulars on, on cold case and played Michael Jordan's father in space in jam. Space yeah. jam. Yeah. Okay. Um, but Tom and I, I remember one day we we're sitting in the bleachers watching a Jerry's li living room rehearsal. And it was the one where Julia sort of invented the idea of slipping out of the room just when, when, you know, George is going, all this schmoopy stuff is making me and Elaine and everybody crazy, right, Elaine? And he points, and she's just walked out the door. But she invented that. And we were watching her do that. And, you know, we were just looking at each other going, God, wouldn't it be amazing to come to work like this every day? Yeah. You know, I mean, it was so fun and relaxed. 
But I did get to hear that someone didn't like the script. And so I kind of walked away thinking, I'll be lucky if it airs. Because I didn't get the humor of stuff I do most of the time, you know? I mean, when I did Austin Powers, all you had to do was look at Mike Myers' face and you kind of got it. But I did, you know, I didn't know the movie was going to be that big. But yeah, I, I, so I had no idea that the episode was even going to be one of their good ones. Um, uh, did, we did get a good ovation from the audience, which was a good sign, I remember. But yeah, I, I thought maybe that that it wasn't going to be one of the good ones. Anyway, go have some, yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, so it, there was a, a few days. So what happened about maybe three weeks later, one of my, I was in this acting class, um, which is really how I got the job in the first place because Jeffrey Tambor was part of the class. He was in the master's class and right. substitute taught uh, us in the advanced class. But one of my classmates came up to me and she goes, you know, I know a friend of Mario Joyner's who's like Jerry's best friend. He's a stand-up comedian. And he told my friend that they were editing your episode and they were thinking it was coming out really, really good. And that was about a week before it aired. So I said, oh, that that's good news. I expected like kind of the opposite, you know. So there was that. And then the funniest thing is the night the episode aired, a friend of mine reserved a room in this great Hollywood restaurant uh, and reserved the whole back room with a big screen TV. And it must have been about 12 or 15 friends. And we're watching it. And they, had, she had just recently bought, like I think it was a new Cadillac. And I guess it was parked on, on um, Highland Avenue in Hollywood out front. And we hear this gigantic crash. It was like an explosion right in the middle of the episode. And everybody gets up and runs out front. A van had hit her car. And, and it was like so demolished that we never got to watch the second half of the episode. So I didn't even get to see the whole episode when it aired the first time. Wow. And uh, yeah, so I didn't really know, you know, I, and you, you can't really judge your own performance anyway. I mean, I always say an actor has to watch themselves at least three times before they can actually see themselves. Right. Like the first time, all you can see is how much got cut out. Mm. The second time, <laughs> you know, you have to deal with the way you look and the way you sound. And then maybe the third time you can actually go, okay, I'm going to really watch what I did and see if I like it. Right. So... So, yeah, that that was a I didn't even get to see it. But, you know, I know like the next day people started to stop me places and go like, oh, you, you look just like that guy that was on Seinfeld last night. And I was like, I was, I was. I was. So um, little by little, I was to start learning that that it was a hit. And, uh, you know, Seinfeld was still on the air for two more years right so yeah. uh three more years and um you know so uh time has changed a lot of things too i mean i don't know if it was everybody's like second favorite episode way back then but now whenever they hold polls and stuff it usually comes in like number two behind the contest yeah, I mean, it, that's, it, it's, like I said, if you just ask anybody named Seinfeld episodes, those are like the first two. Cedric, I think we have you back now. You, uh, we were saying, mm -hmm. did you feel or, how, that this was going to be a big episode when y'all were on set? Um, actually, I didn't. I was just so excited that this, that was my first job straight out of Cal Arts. Uh, I, I didn't feel the same way um, a, a few of the people on the set felt. I, I thought the show was funny. You know, just based on the reactions alone, <laughs> it was funny to me. <laughs> you, you know, you know what I thought was so hilarious were the armor thieves because Yul Vasquez, who played the the you know the Cuban one, um, it was just written that they were both gay, but it wasn't written that he had this like lisping Cuban accent. Uh -huh. So he he threw that in because 
Yul Vasquez is almost like 100% plays, you know, Hispanic characters. Uh, and um, I thought he was like going to steal the show because every time he, he talked, I would, I would laugh. And although show night, they had to show the, a tape of, of them because they didn't actually go out to the New York street on show night, you know, to shoot. So they had pre-shot them. But uh, without a doubt, I thought that guy was going to just steal the show. I mean, they did get to come back two more times. Yeah, they're in the chair walk and a couple other ones. I think. And, and uh, the Puerto Rican Day Parade, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, I got to tell you, it's not too long after the episode aired, Spike Ferriston, who wrote it, had a party and he invited me. And I went there and he had been telling me that he wanted to write more soup Nazi, but they just didn't want him to. And it was kind of making me really depressed, but I saw Yul Vasquez and John Paragon there that had played Don War Thieves. And I went up to them and I said something like, yeah, you know, Spike wanted to do more of my character, but they won't let him or whatever, but maybe you guys will get to go back. And they go, oh, we've already been back. We've already filmed another episode. And it was like, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah. And all I could think of was like, they didn't like me, you know? No. Jerry no. didn't like me, you know? Because that's what an actor's brain does. I mean, there's no other reason that you don't go back unless they just didn't like you. But but he, um, he, Jerry man. seems so giving. And Cedric, I think you were telling me that he was even very giving to you on set, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Jerry took time to come to me, uh, congratulate me, and let me know that I did an excellent job. And I really appreciated that. Yeah. And he was pretty giving. I mean, uh, just as a guy, because when you think about it, the show's named after him. He created it. He's the star. He's the executive producer. He's the co-writer. All this stuff. And But to me, he seemed like he wanted everyone else to be funnier than he was. Right, Larry? Yeah, definitely. He He probably preferred that everyone was funnier than him to tell you the mm-hmm. truth because he uh well first of all like he's the only guy that has ever said, professionally said to me you know your idea was better than mine mm-hmm. I mean, i've never heard that from a pro- yeah. like director or producer they either you know they tell you how they want you to do it and you have to do it yeah. um it's funny it's funny you mentioned that, Larry, because when you were sharing your story earlier about the audition process, it made me think of something that I've heard countless times over the years. A lot of times the directors, producers, they don't know what they want. And as I listen to your story, you show them what they needed. <laughs> That's what I guess, I, I guess so. I guess so. Um, and, and yeah, you're right when you say that, because that's that's what every buddy will tell you that they don't really know what they want and right. they're waiting for someone to show it to them. Mm-hmm. But also they probably have an idea in their head and they, you know, they're secretly waiting for the person to come in with their idea. Yeah. But, yeah. but um, with me, definitely I learned about 11 years later, I had a conversation with Spike and he, I, I remember that Mark Hirschfeld came out of the, the casting room and he told me to go ahead and leave Mm -hmm. um after my second time reading it and he said we're what he were used the strangest phrase he said we're having a conceptual disagreement in there Mm -hmm. so go ahead and go home now i got paged by my agent before i got off the lot that i was hired so they settled their disagreement pretty quickly but about 11 years later i asked spike i said what was you know, the disagreement. And he said, well, they, they thought you were, they, they liked you. And of course, um, uh, the late Richard Libertini was also there um, Mm. at the callback and he's a genius with foreign characters. And that's like most of his career. And I loved the guy, you know, so I didn't think I had a chance to get it with him being there, but they were also considering Tony Shalhoub um, although he wasn't there. And uh, I guess they were saying that they they thought I was a little funnier um, and Libertini was like number two. And But then a few people were worried that I was totally unknown 
and it was a big role. So that was the argument. And Jerry finally gave, gave let it let Spike make the decision. He said, "Well, you wrote it. You wrote the character. Which guy is your favorite?" And Spike said, "Definitely the angry New York guy because that's closer to the real, the real person I wrote this about." And um, they let, I guess, Jerry let him have his way. So there you go again with Jerry letting, you know, a first time Seinfeld writer, you know, that was his very first thing he wrote for Seinfeld and he let him make that decision. So uh, there you go with Jerry again. So, um, so I have Spike really to thank, you know, for, for choosing me. So, you know, uh, with uh, Spike, I, I've yeah. had Spike on the show before. Spike Ferriston, oh. great, great guy, phenomenal human being, big car enthusiast. We like to talk cars from time to time on mm -hmm. Twitter. But he, he was telling me, you know, he had the idea from the actual guy that you, you've referenced before, and that was the name that they called him on the, on the New York streets. Oh, this guy, he's a soup Nazi. Was there ever – okay, two-part question. Did you, one, as an actor, did you want to go see who this guy was prior to playing him – and then the second, the follow-up to that is, did you have any reservations about how now everyone's going to think this guy is after your portrayal? Well, okay, so um, I didn't even know that story about there being a real guy until shoot day. So I, I was pretty much going to do what I was going to do no matter what, but somewhere in one of the last rehearsals on shoot day jerry said to spike uh do you want to tell larry any behavior that the real guy does and i went real guy and spike goes yeah that's it's really based on a real guy in new york and i went wow i didn't know that and he said yeah you know when i was on the letterman staff the letterman writers nicknamed him the soup nazi and uh that's why i wrote this and i went oh wow and he kind of said, "Now nah, you're doing everything pretty much right. Just he's very, you know, all about the soup. So just, you know, keep it all about serving the soup. Like, you know, the, and that was my idea coincidentally anyway, because, you know, I was in that acting class. And I remember when I went into the audition, I remember thinking, you know, of Milton and uh, Jeffrey, my acting teachers that they would probably say to me, remember this guy, he doesn't want to make a scene. He doesn't want to have a scene with anybody. He just wants to serve the soup. You know, he's a person, not an actor. They used to say that, be a person, not an actor. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of in my head to just concentrate on the soup until they pushed me too far. You know what I mean? And I just, I could not take it anymore. And Spike kind of felt like that's the way Al was anyway. Like Al wouldn't be generally nasty or in a bad mood or anything. It's just as long as you did your thing right, you know, you got your soup. It was just if you, you know, the rules are there. And if you didn't just do the proper rules, he, he would yell at you. So, so supposedly it wasn't, difficult to get soup from Al, but, you know, a lot of people did get yelled at because, you know, people just don't generally follow rules, you know. <laughs> I, you know, I have on Cameo, like, it literally says, if you don't read this, please don't book. And then underneath it says, I cannot do commercials and I cannot mention company names. These are just for friendly you know, person to person, personal things. Do you know that at least every two days I get a total attempt at a commercial? You know, every, at least, at, you know, four times, five times a week, I, I get these ones that are like, hey, if you are going to buy a house, buy a house from, you know, and then I, you can decline it with a comment. And I just like, what part of I can't do commercials did you not get? Yeah. You know? And I, I probably shouldn't be a wise ass, you know, but, um, <laughs> you know, you got to let them know what time it is right, sometimes, you know? Right. Yeah. Cause, Cause it does people that can't like read things and follow rules do bug me. So there's where I am. Like the soup Nazi is like, 
I am bothered by people that can't follow simple rules and stuff. And so many people are like that. They just have this sort of contrary behavior, you know, where they almost intentionally do things the opposite that they know they're supposed to. So, you know, I, I mean, but um, so the sec, so I didn't really let the knowledge of Al at the last minute change anything I did. And then the second half of your question was, uh, what would you say? Did I? Were you worried that like your portrayal would now be projected on this guy forever and people would think that he's just this angry person? I didn't really think, think of that at all. And almost immediately, like literally, you know, the show airs on Thursday. By Friday evening, friends are calling me going, are you watching the news? I'm going, no. And they're saying, watch the news. They've got, and I said, why? And they got, they, they've got clips of this real soup guy in New York alongside of you from Seinfeld. So all weekend they were running these clips of Al and me sort of side by side. And I was, I was inexperienced with the rules of television at the time. Like I thought I was going to be making money off that right, stuff. Right, but right. It's called newsreel. You don't get paid for it. <laughs> but uh, so I was like all weekend and probably an, another reason why my character's popular all weekend long i was being shown over and over and over again on the nice, news nice. and they were showing the real al so i got to see very quickly what al was like and he he was you know just as rough i mean he had a slightly different voice and everything but he could be just as rough as the character i played so I didn't think it was going to hurt his reputation or anything. Um, the, o the one downside was maybe a week or two later, David Letterman had Al as a guest on his show. And David Letterman introduced him as my next guest was on an episode of Seinfeld. And it was Al, not me. And I went, no, no, everyone's going to think that that, you know, he played himself and that, it, you know, there goes my career. And I even <laughs> called the Letterman offices, but all they told me is Dave never apologizes and he never retracts. And I went like, great. You know? <laughs> yeah, so, thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. All right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, thanks for ruining my career, you know. <laughs> so... But that was my that was my big fear was that people weren't going to realize it was an actor and I wasn't going to get like the credit for it. Yeah. And you know to this day, I mean when I was still doing personal appearances uh up till the pandemic, if I would do an autograph show, I'd still get a large number of people that would come up to me and say, "You know, I was at your soup stand and it was closed." And I would have to go, no, it's not my soup stand. I, I'm the actor who played the part on the television show. I'm not a restaurant owner. Yeah. <laughs> and I would, I, you know, which is, it's really the reason I wrote my book. And if you guys have never seen my book, I wrote a book called Confessions of a Soup Nazi, an Adventure in Acting and Cooking. Right, yeah. And it's a, it's a book about a journeyman acting career mixed with 52 of my actual recipes that I cook and like where they intersect and like why I would cook something a certain way. And so it's a book of stories really with recipes. But the reason I wrote it is because my friends who would sometimes accompany me to these autograph shows, they would go, you know, so many people think you're like a professional chef or a restaurant owner why don't you capitalize on it and write a cookbook? Absolutely. And I would go like, well, first of all, I've never written down a recipe. You know, I've been cooking most of my life, but I just like, you know, you know, season to taste and whatever. And so I'd have to write everything down and, and I don't want to do that. And then, you know, I don't cook that many different things to write like a whole book about it. But they, they really kept my friends, especially this one friend of mine, she kept bugging me and she kept going, when are you going to write that book? And then one time I was visiting them, they lived in Pittsburgh and I was a guest for a few days in their house. And she said, sit down and write something, you know? So I wrote, I, it's sort of a paragraph and it's actually the first page. And what I wrote that day was, 
was um, wait, let me, hold on. I think I can remember it, but I wrote. Um, now this is a sort of a chronological story of my cooking and acting life. So if you really can't wait a while for my mulligatawny soup recipe, no, okay. So the first thing I wrote was, this is not so much a cookbook as it is the memoirs of a kid from Brooklyn whose working single mother never learned to cook. It was either learn to cook or live with eating TV dinners and macaroni with ketchup his whole life. Macaroni with ketchup was the only thing my mom knew how to cook. And uh, anyway, so that's what I wrote, that like paragraph. And I stuck it in the desk drawer of the room that I was staying in, and it sat there for a year. And then a year later, she I finds it, I guess, and she scans it and emails it to me and said, by the way, here's that page you wrote last year. Write something else. <laughs> and so I went, okay. So I, I went from that to, like, when I was a little kid learning how to make eggs and um, learn, I, my first, like, solo thing I invented was the leftover pasta omelet. Like, I put some leftover pasta, rolled it in an omelet, and then put the sauce on and cheese on top. And then, you know, bagel pizzas and stuff. And then when I was a teenager, I was working at a swap meet and I, I had, I was uh, sampling cookware, but in order to do it, I would just cook chicken in lemon and tomato. And uh, uh, I think it was just like lemon and tomato wedges and stuff to show that it doesn't stick. But it was so tasty that I ended up adopting that as a recipe. And then finally, um, because I had worked when I was 15 at a place called the Chili Place, I decided that I needed to make my own chili. So I came up with a really good chili recipe. And at, around that time, I happened into the theater department at my college. I was actually majoring in journalism, but there was a girl I wanted to go out with, and she was a theater major. So I, I just one, yeah, one uh, year I just was signing up for my classes, and I Took on, I think I took all the classes I needed to get an AA degree, and I had, you know, time to take something else, an elective. So I thought, ooh, maybe I should take like a beginning theater class and maybe ask, you know, Stacy out on a date. <laughs> and so I took like theater 101, acting 101, and voice action 101 or whatever, and uh, just became enthralled with having to stand up and like do a speech in front of people. It was exciting. I'd never done it. But um, shortly thereafter, joining the theater department, there was some function, and I made my chili, and I brought it to the function, and the teachers just fell in love with it. And from that time forward, anytime I get cast in a play, the joke was, you know, hey, Larry, your chili got cast in, you know, John Larson's play or whatever. You know, so <laughs> when I got to that point, in, in writing. It was a few pages took me to, to get to that point and said, then I stopped and I sent the pages over to my friend. And I said, what do you think of this? And she said, that's your book. And I said, what? And she goes, where your life as an actor and your life as a cook sort of intersected and tell both stories. And I went, oh, yeah, that that's interesting because you know, I have like some actor friends that cook and sometimes we cook together and I said, that could actually work, you know? And so that's, that was why I wrote the book, you know, and you know, how I came up with that format. But, um, it really, you know, it, it came off the fact that most people think that the soup Nazi on Seinfeld is not an actor, but for some reason they took a chance on hiring a real chef to play, you know, <laughs> six scenes. And I actually said that to a guy once at an autograph show. Like, I try never to be, you know, arch with fans of the show because I feel like I have a responsibility to Jerry and right. his yeah, life to, whatever, to treat yes. his fans really well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think the best compliment I ever got was I was doing a thing for Sony 
and it was about like four hours of meeting and greeting. And one of the Sony execs said, you know what I like about you is you treat the last fan the same as you treated the first fan. And I said, well, I'm trying, man. I'm, it's not happening by accident. I'm exhausted. <laughs> right. But, um, but anyway, uh, one time I was doing an autograph show and a guy came up and sort of not rudely, but slightly rudely said something to the extent of, so, you know, do you ever get the idea to maybe do some more acting after you did Seinfeld or, you know, was just that the end of your career or say, he just put it in a way that kind of made me angry. And I mm -hmm. said, I said, let me pose this to you, pal. The hottest show on television is going to take an episode and cast a guy that's never acted before in his life as the title character and mm. let him handle six scenes in a half hour show. And then when the guy does it well enough to get nominated for an Emmy and the show becomes one of their most popular shows, he never acts again. You know, <laughs> right, the right. right. The guy, he, he had to let him know. Looked, he the, just know, looked at me and went, um, yeah, you're right. My bad. <laughs> and he walked away. Right. And I had a, a friend sitting next to me and I went, how rude was I? And she goes, you were smiling. Yeah. <laughs> she, goes, <laughs> she goes, you were pretty condescending. And I went, yes. So well, it, happened. That one. it happens. It said you had something? Yes, I, um, Larry, you mentioned earlier your involvement in the theater. Um, I was thinking, considering you've had, you know, a couple decades to flesh this character out, have you thought about or entertained the idea of, you know, writing a play, uh, doing a one-man show? That's a fantastic I, idea. I've thought about doing a one-man show because I, I can talk for hours just about, like, Absolutely. Seinfeld yeah. thing. And then if I added, you know, the rest of my career, it would almost be like reading the book in front of an audience, you know. Mm. But I guess the only reason I've never done it is because really I've just spent my life since Seinfeld trying to work and make money. Mm. And the thought of like doing a one man show would be a risk of putting in a lot of time and maybe not having, you know, a, a return. And so I've never really been in the position where I could do that. Like my friend and I, about, I don't know, 2006, we wrote a sort of a sitcom pilot. And then in 2016, he became obsessed with the idea of us like hiring actors and filming it. And we had two support, had supporting roles in it as well. And we actually did it in 2016 and through 2017 but it cost us about five grand each or maybe a little more and uh he still wants to now work on it and turn it into a feature film because selling a tv pilot is like almost impossible but you know a low budget film there's mark there's places to market them so we may still do it but we spent a lot of money on it and didn't get any money back so mm -hmm. You know, the idea of creating a theatrical event yourself rather than getting hired is is daunting. Like yeah. um, in 2001 to 2003, I toured the country with Barbara Eden and Georgia Engel and a few other people doing the female version of The Odd Couple playing one of the Costas Whaler brothers. And, um, you know, it was pretty good pay. Mm -hmm. And we got to do about 45 cities and we would take these long breaks, but then this show would sell again to a group of theaters and we'd go out again. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of on and off for about three years and it was a wonderful experience. It's the experience you got into acting to do, right. you know, to be a traveling gypsy actor. Mm -hmm. So right. I, I got to fulfill that, you know, experience, which is, was great. Mm -hmm. Um, but we did get paid well for it. So, you know, it was, you know, I was able to mail all that. I was married at the time to an actress and it, it was good for her because I was able to send all the money home and she was able to do more acting work uh, and not have to, you know, work as hard herself. 
right. and because she was working on her career too. So, um, but yeah, doing I, I have many times thought of doing a one man show. I know John O'Hurley does one, and uh, who played Jay Peterman on Seinfeld? Yeah. People listen, yeah. But I, you know, I think John got set up financially from playing Peterman because after playing Peterman, he like bought into Jay Peterman, right, and yeah. became like co-owner with the real Jay Peterman, who I think maybe was in some financial straits or something. And so I think O'Hurley did like quite well with that. And then it afforded him the opportunity maybe, but I know he did like spam a lot on stage on Broadway. And um, I, it was, I was just on a thing with him and, and, and uh, Phil Morris the other day. And John was saying how they're thinking of remounting spam a lot you know, when theater can get back to work. But uh, I know he does a one-man show. And, um, yeah, it's just very hard. I, you know, I get a lot of friends that say, will you do a play with me or whatever, and I just go, I, I can't really afford the rehearsal time and stuff to not be doing something to try to make money, you know? Right. Um, so, anyway, that's kind of where that. that is. I hear that. Well, I mean, you've been more than gracious with your time, Blair. This is my last thing that I, I want to ask really both of you. So I, I, you know, I'm a massive Seinfeld fan. I've seen the episode multiple times, but I haven't seen it since um, I've known Cedric. And you know, I knew you were coming on the show. So I sat and watched it last night. And there was two instances that took place in the soup kitchen that just really popped me and made me laugh. And I just want to know what y'all's favorite. Really, one was Cedric's reaction at the end with the tight, uh, the tight faith you know, this thing. And then the other one was, uh, how dare you kiss in my line? For some reason, when you said that, I don't know why that, those are the two moments that really got me. Um, Cedric first, I guess, favorite moment, uh, from the episode or in the kitchen. And then I want to end it with Larry. Uh, that's, that's a good question. I never thought about that, but I mean, the first thing to come to me is, you know, uh, Julie Louise Dreyfus uh, scene when she comes to thank the uh, soup Nazi <laughs> for the boy, <laughs> you know, and he blasts her. <laughs> if I knew it was you, yeah. <laughs> that was that was fun. That that uh, if, if there's a minute, I just have a quick story about oh, that. Go before right I tell you what my favorite one is. Um, this is Larry David. If you're if you're wondering, you know, because he plays this nebbish. Uh, on curb and it's sort of like the way larry david is socially but if at work he's sort of a different guy he's very almost mathematical so one time during that speech where i'm yelling at elaine i picked up uh like a cloth and dabbed my head like i was oh. so angry i was sweating and larry just he didn't give me a lot of direction but he just at one point watched me do that in the rehearsal and went, okay, do everything you're doing, but don't do the thing with the cloth. It's just a little too much. And that's how like specific he is. So I just didn't do that one thing. But um, I, I think my favorite moment is one that Larry invented and reshot later on after the audience left. After the audience left, he wanted to change two things. Um, one thing was when the Spanish guy said, por favor, originally I just yelled, unacceptable. And he wanted me to go, adios, muchacho. <laughs> and I actually had to act that with Larry because the gentleman that had played the Spanish guy had already been released and left. So I actually had to play that with Larry. So he's actually on the other side of the receiving end of adios, muchacho. But then the other thing he wanted to to slightly change was originally when uh, Elaine, you know, went hua hua. I just immediately just yelled, "No soup for you! Come back one year!" And the audience liked it enough, but Larry wanted me to go, "Very good, very good. You know what? What? No soup for you! Come back one year!" <laughs> and he, they brought her back down, and now the whole place was empty, you know. So it was kind of just me and her and the crew. And I think, as I remember, he didn't like really tell her what I was going to do. He just said, well, I want to retake this scene. So she does the Al Pacino thing. And, you know, 
And all of a sudden I go, very good, very good. You know what? And she just goes, what? And then I go, no soup for you. And she literally just dropped to the floor and she was laughing. And like a minute later, she comes back up and she goes, oh, my God, you are so funny. So that's got to be my favorite moment is I made Julia break, you know. And uh, oh, good. But, and, then, and one more thing, because you had mentioned your you love the there's no kissing in my line. Yeah. In the actual rehearsal, there was a line in the scene. You just call it, cost yourself a soup, Fraulein. <laughs> and when we rehearsed it, the 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 cast got into um, an argument, sort of, over how you pronounce fra. Is it Fraulein, Fraulein, Fräulein? You know, and they're going back and forth and back and forth, and I'm like dare not say I, I wouldn't know anyway but you know i was too scared to like you know speak up or give an opinion and so uh i think they had they shot me saying it both frau line and Freulein. and then they cut it so that's why you <laughs> the whole you, argument you me go, you just got yourself a soup and it stops like abruptly because i took a breath and they had to cut it and, uh, oh, that's awesome. So it's not there. But it just, yeah, it, that was such a funny moment because everything stopped and they're all going like, well, and Heidi Swedberg laid, uh, got in on it because she's German. And it was just like going back and forth. And I'm just going, like, here, I'll say it any way you guys want. Every, but, uh, that is how I'll say it. We're not going to use it anyway. So, <laughs> you know, what was the, what that's was the, so, That cut is so abrupt. That's but, funny. Uh, See, I love hearing stuff like that and, 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 and knowing small little details of why certain things happen. Yeah. But again, you've been so generous with your time. I, I think we could talk for another hour or two, but um, yeah. the, the, mask, the masks are available at boomernaturals.com. You can yep. see no mask, no soup there. And uh, there it is right there. Definitely go ahead and get it. And you can book Larry on Cameo as well and get his book. It's available on Amazon. I'm going to order my copy as soon as we get off. I'd love to read yeah. through that and, and cook some of the right. recipes. So, uh, Larry, I appreciate it so much. I said the, re the recipes are good. I, I do get a lot of requests from my friends to make some of their favorites, whether it's the turkey goulash or the split pea or the mulligatawny. A lot of people love my mulligatawny recipe, and I made it specifically because of Seinfeld. I just I felt I had to. Yes. But it took a whole weekend of trial by error because mulligatawny is one soup that is not made the same way twice anywhere. It could be a cream, milk, coconut milk base. It could be a chicken stock. It could be vegetarian. Al puts like pistachios and stuff in his, and I don't. But um, I did come up with what I think is a real winner on the mulligatawny. So give it a shot. It's not difficult. <laughs> we're, defi we're definitely going to do it. And I'm glad that after all these years, Cedric and Larry, y'all got to see one another again. Yeah, it's really good to see you, Cedric. I've always thought you did that so wonderfully. And, you. Uh, you know, and people have commented to me about you. You know, oh, a excellent. lot of people, you know, because I get to meet, like, in an autograph show, I'll meet, like, a hundred Seinfeld fans of the episode. Wow. And I've heard a lot of times, I love the guy that, you know, his <laughs> smile turns to fear after you yell at him. Excellent. So you get a lot of good comments on me. <laughs> Anson Williams once uh, answered a question for me. He was sitting next to me and someone said, so why do you think, you know, your, your guest spot on Seinfeld is so popular? And before I can even open my mouth, Anson Williams goes, 32 million viewers. <laughs> and I went, what he said. Yeah. <laughs> that, yes. that, that about sums it up. So, so you got to think about that, Cedric, that you've probably been seen by a lot more people than, than you know. Right. Like one, one time it aired, there were like 32 million people. And then I heard on the first re-airing, re which was in February, um, it beat ER in the ratings, which Seinfeld had never done. Wow. And there were like 33 million or something. So many, many millions of people have seen you do that. Wow. <laughs> More than you think. And did so it actually was all mine. 
<laughs> pleasure was all mine, Larry. Appreciate you. Yeah. Yes. All right. Mind that you were there. Yes. Sure enhanced. It. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks, you guys. It's been a pleasure.